Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about using JavaScript to create interactive installations. So I'm Hugh Kennedy from Sydney, Australia. I'm a graphics programmer, JavaScript developer, and prototyper. But before I was a full-time programmer, I studied interactive installation art. It's a broad, relatively recent category of art that is ultimately about playing with space and perception. This might take the form of an immersive environment, one where the entire space is transformed. Take, for example, this work displayed at the Palais de Tokyo last year. It takes the form of a simulated gondola for visitors to navigate, combined with real-time sound and projection. Other times, this might involve modifying the public space to present a new perspective. In 1975, Gordon Maddock Clark took a building scheduled for demolition and cut out a large, perfectly conical hole in the side as a critique of urban gentrification. Others choose to play with robotics and sculpture. A senseless drawing bot does exactly what you think it does. Sometimes projects are just for fun. You can use projections and projection mapping to great effect here too. Interactive installations invite visitors to engage with the work directly. Here, Google's Data Arts team collaborated with artist Janet Upperman to create a huge projected sculpture. The projection itself can be interacted with by anyone using a mobile phone. This is all using JavaScript. The mobile interface is a web page and the projection is too. It's a massive full screen Chrome instance running WebGL. Installations for me are appealing because they provide unique sensory experiences that can't be replicated by visiting a website. There's good reason for you to take to leave home and take the time to visit an exhibition. I first really experimented with Node and JavaScript around 2011 and started to integrate it with my work while I was studying at university. While I was researching my next project, I came across a cheap telepresence tutorial from Johnny Lee and decided to use it as a starting reference for my work. It wasn't as easy as I thought it would be at first. The Roomba vacuum cleaner was just too expensive for a, for a student, so I tried building something simpler from scratch with an Arduino and some motors. Unfortunately, the motors were too weak to carry even a small laptop, so I went for a phone instead. It's really light and still has a camera and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth support. Eventually, I ended up with this, a small, simple robot with a phone placed on top of it. It would move around the exhibition space on its own, avoiding obstacles that it might run into taking photos of the visitors, and posting them to its social media accounts. While the motors were driven by an Arduino and the images captured using processing, I used Node.js for uploading and posting them online. Generally, when we think of Node, we think of web servers, frameworks like Express and Happy, or build tools like Browserify, Webpack, and Babel. But at its core, Node is a platform for managing any kind of input and output. It's really good at being the glue between other systems. While Node is most often used for tasks such as accessing the file system, interacting with databases, or plugging into REST APIs, there's also a ton of tools out there to get it working for less conventional problems. Using Node, you can interact with Arduinos, make use of computer vision, drive lighting rigs, talk to mobile devices, or use Bluetooth to remotely access other devices. Most importantly, you can also take advantage of web browsers and all of the functionality they have built into them, too. There's a lot of options for getting a node talking to other bits of hardware. For example, here's this video I dug up of Substack playing Matador with a JavaScript-powered quadcopter back in 2012. This is using, among other things, the AR drone package on NPM. Then there's the NodeBots community which provides tutorials and organizes meetups across the world, helping people get started with JavaScript robotics. You can use Arduinos for all sorts of physical inputs and outputs, and you can handle them with JavaScript using Johnny5. Or if you're looking to communicate wirelessly with other devices, you can use Noble and Blenner for Bluetooth low energy modules and peripherals. Then there's WebGL, which you can use for high fidelity visuals. With WebGL 2, We've got a powerful graphics API available to us, made simpler with frameworks such as 3.js, StackGL, and Regal, and platforms such as Unity. 
in the same way that we can, can for our slides, all we need to do to hide the fact that it's running um, in a browser is to put everything into full screen. Once you've gotten rid of the browser's UI, there's nothing stopping you from doing projection mapping. The process itself is relatively simple to implement with a single projector and is generally done pretty manually in most projects. I haven't seen many examples of this being done with JavaScript yet, uh, but in the case of a tool like MadMapper, it's simply a matter of aligning the projection with the surface you're projecting onto. It's a little tedious to set up, but works really well once you've done so. If we can provide node access to the browser's functionality, we have a very flexible platform for, for providing a wide variety of tasks. The simplest way to combine the two is using WebSockets. If we have a single node instance running the socket server, we can open up a WebSocket connection with a browser that's plugged into a projector for our own live display. There's also the option of connecting multiple devices to the node server too. You could have multiple displays or have visitors interact with the installation using a mobile phone. This is great because phones have a number of sensors that you can take advantage of for free. Here we're using your friend's gyroscope to control a two-player game of Pong. We use the vertical axis of each gyroscope to control the position of a player's paddle. When the ball hits a paddle, the phone will play sound and vibrate as well. If you add a horizontal axis to that control, you can get something more akin to a laser pointer. This is a really nice, natural interaction. Here we're painting a display with colored light using the phone's gyroscope as um, an invisible brush. The setup is pretty haphazard, but you only need a Pico projector, a shoebox, some cardboard, and a phone to get something together. The popular choice for WebSockets is Socket.io, but WebSocket Stream is a nice, simple alternative as well. Of course, you're only halfway there until you have the opportunity to create and work with sound. For this, we can use the, br the browser's Web Audio API. It's quite straightforward to trigger sound or distort it or generate it from scratch. There's even a little known MIDI API built into recent browsers as well. So you can use your MIDI devices as a control interface. A really great example of these being used extensively is in Loop Drop by Matt McKegg. It's a full audio sequencer built on top of JavaScript. <laughs> You can also take any audio input and get back the waveform and frequency data in real time. This is great for feeding into live visuals to make them react to music or sound. I've written a little library for getting this data set up quickly, which you can find at GitHub uh, at qsk slash web audio analyzer. In a performance setting, you can use WebRTC's get user media function to get access to your microphone and do audio analysis on top of that. Using this technique, I put together the visuals for a live set at CampJS with Matt McKegg earlier this year. The end result was a full audio visual set powered solely by JavaScript. The audio is sequenced in loop drop, and the visuals are full screen WebGL, with audio analysis being done on the microphone input to get it reacting to the music in real time. I can't speak much for how the audio was put together, but I can show you quickly just an example of the visuals and how they were put together. We have the analyzer node is returning a list of numbers that represent the waveform for each frame of audio. We feed that into a circular buffer, and then we can distort the geometry and WebGL using that. Add a keyboard shortcut for changing the rotation randomly. Uh, you can get some nice different results from different angles. And then if you can 
combine them with the reflection effect. It gets some really nice results quite quickly. Finally, it's worth taking a look at Electron. By combining a browser environment with Node, you get all of the above tools available to you in one place. There's no longer any need to use WebSockets to coordinate your server and renderer context, which simplifies your code. You can package everything up into a single executable, which will save you time when it comes to setting the project up in a new space, or even helping others set it up while you're not nearby, which can potentially save you on travel and transportation costs. Let's take a look at what this all looks like together in practice. A few weeks ago, my friend Emily Yang and I put together an installation at an art festival back home in Sydney using a lot of these techniques under the hood. From start to finish, it was about two or three weekends worth of work. Here's a video. At the core of the installation was a Chrome instance running a WebGL visualization, which we projected onto the wall. We used Elite Motion Controller to pick up precise hand and finger positions in 3D space. Elite Motion has a nice JavaScript library called LeapJS, which works the same way in both the browser and in Node. Under the hood, the Leap is running a WebSocket server for the browser to connect to directly. When deployed as an installation, we feed microphone input through an analyzer node to the WebGL visualization. This way, it can react to ambient sound and music around the environment. In another setting, we can easily use an MP3 file instead of the microphone to get uh, any audio of our choosing. So the project is called Ectoplasmid, and because it's all browser-based, you can find it online as well. It acts purely as an audio visualization by default, but if you plug in a Leap Motion controller, you can control it the same way as you would in an installation context. So what now? Start experimenting. Pick any two of the technologies I've just spoken about, or even mixing one with something new, and try and find an interesting way to pick, use them together. Maybe WebGL and Arduino, or WebRTC and WebAudio, or MIDI and robotics. Don't spend time thinking about the tools or trying to find the optimal solution for your programming problem or front-end build setup. Just, pl just plug stuff together and get it working first. You'll make fast progress and can always rewrite it again once you've got a better idea of how everything should fit together in the final product. I imagine most of us here use JavaScript every day. It's familiar and one less obstacle to creating new work. The community and tools available to you are super broad, arguably more so than any other community that's formed around a particular platform, language, or tool. Use NPM to your advantage. Most importantly, JavaScript is fun, at least most of the time. It's a great language for prototyping in, allowing you to get set up and make early progress quickly. So push the language new and interesting places and see where it takes you. Thank you. <laughs>